Am I gonna sit here and tell you that they made a Dungeons and Dragons flight simulator? Of course I'm not. I'm gonna tell you they made two. Well, okay, maybe that's not the most accurate way to put it. There were two games called Dragon Strike. Both versions followed roughly the same story and involved fighting from Dragonback. However, only the PC version released in 1990 was a flight simulator. And that is the topic of this video. The other Dragon Strike, which came out in 1992, was an NES game that focused on top-down dragon combat. And Flight Sim Dragon Strike wasn't merely a flight simulator by technicality. This thing fully committed to being a flight simulator. It also might very well be the only true flight simulator in existence to be about jousting. Though there's a few small indie titles about dragon jousting as well, but none of them really approach the level of being an actual flight simulator. This game was weird. It was such an experiment, and to be honest, I kinda wish modern D&D would release a few experimental titles like this in the same way. Speaking of modern D&D, I set this video up for this week because the Dragonlance setting has just been revived in 5th edition Dungeons and & Dragons, and I kinda wanna inform new fans about just how absurdly popular Dragonlance used to be. Literally hundreds of Dragonlance books were written. There was also a very bad movie. Look, you know how popular it was. It was so popular that they bothered releasing a goddamn flight simulator. This is also a cool opportunity, in my opinion, to introduce Westwood Gaming to the channel, because they're gonna come up a lot in future. They were one of a long line of legendary game studios who got completely gutted and burned by EA. One of their great masterpieces, Eye of the Beholder, is arguably the most famous and best received D&D video game pre Baldur's Gate. They made it in partnership with SSI, who had the D&D license at the time. And while Eye of the Beholder was their first big hit, it was not their first game. Westwood cut their teeth by being a studio who created ports of games to other consoles. But they were clearly hungry to make their own games, because their ports were so thoroughly made that they sometimes edged closer to being remakes than they were to ports. Eventually, however, they were given the opportunity to develop a few games on their own including Mars Saga and a Battletech game. Soon, however, SSI gave them the opportunity to get their hands on the D&D license. Their first D&D game was Hillsfar. Their second was Dragon Strike. Their next game was Eye of the Beholder. Dragon Strike was the practice round before an era-defining hit. And while Dragon Strike is super niche and wildly dated, Westwood's greatness was already on display. When I first heard about this game, I was hyper fixated on the flight sim aspect of things. But as the day got closer to making this review, I started to get very excited about the fact that this was a jousting game. A Knight's Tale is one of my favorite movies. You know that scene where William spears a guy and then screams his own name? He's like, William! See, I want to do that. I want to stab some dude and shout William. That's my name. So with a ton of enthusiasm, I got started. The very first thing you notice as you're reading the manual and booting the game up is the fact that this game has a bit of an unexpected tone. In most fantasy settings, especially role-playing games, dragon riders are far beyond the scope of power levels. You're riding a dragon. You can fly and you can burn down entire cities at once. You're just, you're just too powerful for games to even entertain the idea of it being balanced for you to be able to play as one. So with you playing a dragon rider in Dragon Strike, you might expect that the game would have a very heroic fantasy vibe, but it doesn't. The War of the Lance is basically a story in which the evil dragon riders have spent half a decade building and using their dragon army. The good side only gets dragons halfway through the war, so you're not a great and glorious hero. You're some dipshit knight squire with literally two weeks of training. You're riding dragons that are all on their 14th rider because they die constantly. This is not a power fantasy. This is fucking Dragon Stalingrad. First man gets a dragon, second man gets a lance. First man dies, second man takes his dragon and charges. If you hear the whistle of enemy dragon fire, then you have mere seconds to dodge. For Crane, you dog. For Paladin! And to further your lack of prestige, you don't even get sent to the front line. You're on guard duty back in the homeland. Encounter number one is a couple of Dragon Rider scouts who stumble into your station. So, let's get fighting. But before we get too far into it, if you like what I do on this channel, it would... 
it would mean the world to me if you would like the video. Look, we gotta pull out every algorithmic trick in the book if we want YouTube to recommend a- Jesus Christ. Oy. Look, we gotta pull every algorithmic trick in the book if we want YouTube to recommend a niche dragon flight simulator from 1990. So let me know down in the comments what your favorite color of dragon is, cause, I mean, that would help. And if you're new here, consider subscribing to the channel. I review all sorts of video games that are related to tabletop. Most often that takes the form of Dungeons and & Dragons and Warhammer. So if that sounds good to you, please subscribe to the channel. They subscribed, Daisy. They did it. They did it. Oh, good. We d oh. This being an old game, the controls are the sort where you flail about and think the game is impossible when you first start. Things might be easier with a joystick, as this was probably meant to be played on, but it's not too bad on keyboard. Unlike a lot of old games, the Dragon Strike controls aren't poorly thought out, they're just a bit unfamiliar. The game actually shipped with three different control layouts you could swap between keyboard, keyboard and mouse, and joystick. The game defaulted me to keyboard controls, and I didn't realize I could change the layout until halfway through, so I just stuck with the one I was used to. That said, the mouse controls were surprisingly clean for the era, so if you decide to play this, I'd recommend you use that layout instead. The flight simulator elements were somewhat straightforward, and the UI was actually incredibly well thought out, and clearly presented all of the information. You had a bar to the side of your screen showing your altitude, and also whether you were ascending, descending, or gliding. Ascending would cause you to lose both power, aka your dragon stamina, and speed, unless you were holding down the acceleration button. You also have a bar for your breath attacks that will regenerate over time. Dragon cardio, if you will. Each dragon you'll be riding gets two different breath weapons, and you'll have to swap between the two to get through your enemy's immunities. However, the real star is the melee combat, which is seldom seen in flight simulators. This is a setting called Dragonland after all, and you've got one such lance, so naturally we're gonna use the hell out of it. Position and angle is everything in Dragon Strike. Melee attacks are done automatically when in range, so it's all about getting yourself to the right strike zones. Passing closely above the enemy dragon will cause your mount to make a claw and bite attack. Contrarily, if an enemy is above you, then your knight will swing with their sword. This is incredibly dangerous to attempt. It's basically the old, drive me closer, I want to hit them with my sword meme. Your knight and your dragon track their health separately. So swinging from below an enemy dragon usually means that they too will take a swing at your rider with their dragon claws. That isn't going to go well for you. Your measly little human has a much smaller health pool than your mount, and health doesn't regenerate very much over the campaign, so you have to make your knight last the duration. Meanwhile, you get multiple opportunities to swap to new dragons over the campaign, so your dragon can take some hits and you can start fresh multiple times. So more often than not, the only time sword attacks will come up is if you're taking a sharply banked turn around another dragon. It won't happen often, but it will happen sometimes. Lastly, the game doesn't explain how attacks with your lance work, but in my experience in game, it's about what you'd expect. Sticking with the pointy end. This is dangerous as hell if you're doing this head to head. Like I said, health is precious, but it's also intrinsically cool as shit, so I constantly did it anyway, even though I didn't actually have to. Anyway, struggling to pull all this together in the early game, the first mission actually takes a lot of mercy on you. The dragon scouts just hold in place and wait for you to kill them. Wait! From here, we actually have a whole campaign to finish off the different branching paths. After the first two missions are done, you're given the opportunity to get promoted to a different order. This will mean that you have to pay two magic items from your inventory to the new order, and you'll switch to a harder campaign path. But you'll get to trade in your bronze mount for a new silver. So hell yeah, I took that offer. Now, about those magic items you have to trade in. Fortunately, before I started playing, I stumbled across a tip on the internet about how I should approach this because it is possible to make an extremely fatal error. You see the magic orb that functions as your radar and the arrow that points you to where your enemies are? Those? Those are both tangible magic items, and you can trade them away. And this would be the worst possible mistake you could make. The game is unplayable without radar. And you also really need that arrow, because certain maps are so large that you have no chance of finding the enemy without them. Fortunately, your healing ointments can be traded instead. 
So do not use a single one of them until you're in the order you want to join. So, having made the choice to upgrade nightly orders, I hit the game's first real challenge that stumped me. The first hard skill test to see if you could play this game and, well, uh... I was weighed, measured, and found wanting. The big issue was this. I was playing the wrong game. Now I, as a guy who was excited to play a jousting sim, you can probably guess that I am a Mount and Blade fan. And if you clicked on this video, there's a higher than normal chance that you are too. When you're playing Mount and Blade, especially the first one, there's this annoying thing the AI does after the first pass of a joust, where they just refuse to peel off for a second pass. They just hug your ass, despite the fact that their lances will do zero damage unless they're charging. So you just kind of have to trick them into separating? You have to run away from them at top speed, then do a sudden break and turn so that they rush past you. Then you'll be able to have the distance required to make a second charge at them. This is the dance I was trying to do in Dragon Strike. After the initial clash, the Black Dragon was perpetually right behind me, just like in Mountain Blade. And none of my tricks from that game could shake him. And even worse, this was not Mountain Blade. Lances are useless in that game unless you're charging, but the Black Dragon didn't have that problem. From right behind me, I was getting repeatedly evaporated by Dragon Breath. I was, I was frustrated. I was angry. This, this is not how a jousting simulator is supposed to work. And then something finally clicked for me. The AI isn't actually failing at jousting. The AI is succeeding at dogfighting. I was so focused on the jousting that I'd nearly forgotten that this is a flight simulator. So when an enemy is on your tail, it's doing a good job. And you gotta pull every trick in the book to get it off your tail. Diving, flying close to cover, etc, etc. Or, better yet, don't get yourself in that position at all. Save your melee attacks for finishing off enemies that you've weakened with Dragon Breath. And it was this new understanding that finally let me continue progressing the game. And sure, the game never actually got easy, but from this moment on, the challenges at least became surmountable. Having finally overcome this dragon, reeling with how hard this game is, I am presented with an opportunity to move to another order and access even harder missions in exchange for a golden dragon. But like, I mean, I, guys, I was already struggling with this game, but mama didn't raise no quitter. Mama raised a maverick. The fine details of the campaign aren't worth diving too deeply into, but you slowly start making a name for yourself as the war rages on. There was a single mission where I got to dive bomb a bunch of ships, and that was incredibly fun. The game absolutely got dive bombing right. Arrows whizzing past, you can die at any moment, and you have to time things perfectly or else you'll just crash into the deck. Superb. I wish there were more missions where I had to do this. The big battles were quite fun too. It's much easier to shake people off your tail when there are allied dragon riders around. You just fly towards them and they handle your pursuer. And you can do the same for them. It's good. This is a good time to dive bomb our way into the presentational aspects of this game. And in a way, it's kind of bittersweet on that front. This is an old game, of course, so the tech was naturally very limited. But where it's clear that they were clearly pushing the tech is that this, as you may have noticed, is one of those early games that were using 3D before the dawn of 3D. But the 2D pixel work in this game is equally impressive. This is mainly the work of Westwood's legendary pixel artist, Rick Parks, who sadly passed away in 1996. He's a big part of why games like Eye of the Beholder look so good. Everything is just so polished in this game. And we get lots and lots of Rick's art between missions. We get plenty of mission briefings that give the levels context. It's lovely. You even get a unique write-up of what happens when you die on each individual mission. It's not just a you died end screen. And early on, this really reinforces the D&D Stalingrad vibe before you've earned some respect. Because your death usually just gets spoken of like a statistic. Plenty of dragon riders died in this attack, and you were one of them, I guess. We're gonna have to recruit more now. You're nobody. You aren't shit until the second half of the game. I really love the tone they were going for. However, 
this is where we hit the bittersweet side of things. This game was so well executed, and it pushed the tech so far in pursuit of delivering on their vision. And in my opinion, they delivered the best damn War is Hell Dragon Combat Simulator that anyone could have made in 1990. But to me, it's still, I just, I still feel like it doesn't deliver on the storytelling tone they were going for. And I can't blame anything but 1990 technology for that. The biggest letdown visually is the battlefield, both by ground and air. A lot of these missions are supposed to be set over great clashing ground armies. If you fly too close to the ground on those missions, you'll get peppered by arrows. And if you land, your dragon will start eating enemy soldiers. But like... I mean, come on, where are they? All we see is an empty field. And I know, I don't think there was an actual way to present clashing ground armies on the tech they had, but it was still just really dissonant to experience as a player. Meanwhile, in the sky, it feels less epic that it's always a sunny, cloudless day. There's no smoke or streaking dragon fire from dragon breath, etc, etc. Once again, they could not have added those things. But you tangibly felt their absence. Whatever a great clash of dragons feels like, it isn't this. But where the tech let the game down most was actually the sound work. This was still that classic era of 8-bit music that we know and love. And, I mean, that's not so bad. In fact, I quite like the music they made for this game. If I have a complaint about the music, it's that the music tracks are all too short, and they only play at the start of each mission for around 20 seconds, and then you're left in silence for the rest. Where my real sadness about the audio comes from isn't the music, it's the sound effects. When I just pulled off a difficult aerial maneuver to line up my lance with a dragon's flank, dodging dragon breath and slashing claws, I don't... I don't want it to sound like this. It's just so arcadey. And again, I know, I know, tech limitations. But the very concept of a 3D dragon jousting game set during the War of the Lance, it just, it evokes such powerful mental imagery and sounds. And like, I want the dragons to roar. I want to hear them cry out in pain when they get hurt. And I want to hear the clash of battles beneath me and the sizzle of fireballs rushing past. So I have no criticism of how good of a job Westwood did at all. No one could have made a better version of this game in 1990. My criticism is that 1990 was too early to deliver on the premise. My god, I cannot stop thinking about what this game would have been like if they made it a few years later in the era of Star Fox 64. <sighs> All that aside, I soon began to reach the end of the campaign, squaring off in a boss fight with a death dragon that could only be killed, far as I could tell, with my lance. After that, it was just some large-scale battles, including the final mission over Naraka. And with that, Dragon Strike was over. I really have mixed feelings about this game. I can't say I necessarily enjoyed it, but I really do appreciate it for what it was. And I respect the craftsmanship immensely. But once again, I can't help but be sad that we never got, like, a sequel with the technology that was better able to deliver on the fantasy of dragon jousting. If you ask me, this game desperately needs a modern remake, or a spiritual successor from an indie team who understands it. But unfortunately, this game, while a financial success at the time, only sold 30,000 copies, meaning it has essentially zero cultural impact on the industry. And no two ways about it, I'm sad that we're never going to get Westwood's original idea delivered on. So should you play Dragon Strike? Probably not. Not unless you're already a fan of old flight sims anyway. It's a gigantic learning curve to get into it, and it's not really worth the effort to learn for most players. It's better remembered as a bizarrely well-made, weird game from the past that helped launch Westwood forward into bigger and better games in the following years. And if you like this video, please leave a like and consider subscribing, because this is not even the weirdest old D&D game. This one here is going to be my last video of the year, so I'll be back in January. Gotta take some time, figure out how YouTube taxes work, I gotta clear out my hard drive for the year, and uh, a couple other things. Gotta update my Patreon perks, that kind of stuff. So it's not gonna be a long vacation, it's gonna be catching up on all those other tasks. 
You know, all the stuff that isn't video making but is still important to do. And uh, we smashed my yearly goal completely for this channel. Uh, so I just wanted to give a huge thanks to you guys. We started out this year with this being like a 600 subscriber channel that was about like uh, TTRPG video essays. And the channel went on a bit of a ride as I was exploring what I wanted to do with it. We got into some like niche tabletop review stuff. We got into some like cringy XP to level three skits that weren't very good. And uh, eventually we found what we're doing right now, which is reviewing old video games related to tabletop. And I cannot explain enough just how relieved I am that we have found the channel's focus, and now all I have to do is crank out content. I know what to make now, we just have to keep doing it. Load off my mind, let me tell you. And thank you all so, so much. It seemed a lot of times last year that this channel was just never going to go anywhere, uh, but you all came around and you made it what it is. I think we've still got a lot of room to grow, but frankly, I'm really looking forward to walking that road with you guys. So what can you expect next year? Well, for starters, I have clearly neglected the Warhammer side of my audience a little too long. So we'll probably begin the year with a review of the old Space Hulk dungeon crawlers. And then after that, uh, people who are watching my Strahd's Possession and Stone Prophet videos noted that uh, it is technically a trilogy because there's also an unrelated game using the same engine called Menzo Berenzen. So we'll make sure that gets reviewed before we start any other major projects kind of complete a trilogy that I didn't know I was making. Anyway, thanks so much, you guys. I love you all, and I'll see you next year. Okay, Daisy, say goodbye into the microphone. Say goodbye. Say goodbye for the year. Goodbye for the year. No, don't grab the microphone, you little...